The meeting of two great minds took place in September in 2000 at a conference regarding plasmatic activity in the solar system. Anthony Peratt, the plasma physicist, and David Talbot, the author and researcher, noticed the similarities presented in petroglyphs in Peratt's presentation. David Talbot, already having released the Saturn myth in the early 80s, began to incorporate Anthony Peratt's research into his own and the realisations made by these two men are utterly groundbreaking. It shows us the path to truth, the true nature of godlike activity, and the control inflicted on our kind. Anthony Peratt writes that many petroglyphs apparently recorded several millennia ago have a plasma discharge or instability counterpart, some on a one-to-one -one or overlay basis. Most strikingly, is that the images recorded on the rock art are the only images found in extreme energy density experiments. No other morphology types or patterns are observed. The inward rise of the axis, along with the upward folding of the outer edges of the carved lines and transition to the edge curling, a phenomena recorded in intense electrical discharge radiographs could not have been known to prehistoric man unless he witnessed the same event in the sky. Anthony Peratt's investigation of the rock art led him to collect hundreds of thousands of digital photographs of the petroglyphs. Both himself and his collaborators also recorded the fields of view of the ancient artists and the location of the images with the GPS instruments. By plotting this data on computerised topographical maps, he can calculate where the various forms occurred in the Earth's ancient plasmosphere, and this is what astronomers call the magnetosphere. Anthony Peratt has surmised that a surge of power in the currents driving the auroras had set off the sequence of instabilities, and according to the Thunderbolts project, the entire prehistoric sky around the globe would have appeared to have come to life with a shimmering, shining, enhanced aurora that stretched from pole to pole. It would have featured exactly those abstract figures and stickmen and strange animal-like shapes that appear only in rock art and in high intense energy plasma discharges. He contends that the ancient artists were witnesses to this enhanced aurora and that they recorded what they saw on the most durable recording device available, rock surfaces. From the difference in scale between a laboratory spark and an auroral discharge, Peratt estimates that the ancient displays would have lasted for at least, at least a few centuries, if not millennia, up to 3,000 years of activity. Radiocarbon dating of material overlaying some buried petroglyphs provided a time for the occurrence of the displays to 4,000 and 12,000 years ago, and as Dr. Peratt points out, you can't possibly understand anything until you begin to understand the truth. Wait to hear this. And uh, right now I'm working in um, something very closely related, but it is, uh, but it's different. It's petroglyphs. Okay, it, it, it's not galaxies, uh, rotation magnetic fields in galaxies, which uh, which we produced, which is on our websites or in any number of uh, publications. But it's uh, carvings on rock by man in prehistory. Now, why, why are these important? Uh, this is a picture that I took on the Navajo Reservation, and uh, which is absolutely typical of uh, petroglyphs that one, one will find uh, around the world. Um, as I'm going to show, uh, petroglyphs uh, have a definite orientation. They also uh, change in morphology and shape depending on the latitude that they're found on Earth. And this is typically, um, this is at um, about uh, 36 degrees latitude north, so it's lower than the, uh, than the United Kingdom, but, uh, but perfectly typical uh, around the Earth and the duck-shaped heads appear everywhere as, as, as well as these other symbols, and I'm going to go into uh, why. Um, my first introduction to uh, petroglyphs was uh, by David Talbot. I, I went to a meeting of his by accident and uh, learned something about what they were, were doing. And then uh, he showed me some pictures. And, uh, and I looked at the pictures. And uh, I said, where did you get these pictures? 
because I had never seen them outside of an unclassified environment, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and uh, um, they're on rocks. They're on rocks. Where are these rocks stored? What vault? It's got these <laughs> these rocks, and you know, I was kind of you know, what what am I going to do now? The, uh, and uh, he said, Oh no, they're they're all over. They're petroglyphs. They're they're all over the place. And and, uh, and I was stunned, um, having worked in uh, what's called the high energy density plasmas, high energy density in nuclear physics. Uh, I w was stunned that these uh, pictures, apparently thousands of years old. Uh, preceded what uh, we'd only been recording for about two years with our with our new facilities. It cost a lot of money. Okay. Um, okay. This is a typical uh, petroglyph uh, panel in, in in Arizona. Again, it is typical at the at a, a large uh, number of latitudes found uh, around the world. Uh, to most people looking at this, these are abstract designs, abstract by the, the ancients. It may have been, uh, maybe did not have full control of their facilities, uh, whatever, to, to draw things like this. In, in fact, I'm going to show you that these are very, very accurate replications of what was seen in the ancient sky. Art locations, rock art, it's often called rock art. And, and actually, rock art is a, is, is a good name. Uh, these are uh, typical locations, the well-known locations uh, around the world. Uh, in fact, petroglyphs are, are found on uh, virtually uh, any gra granite or basalt surface or, or any uh, good uh, rock uh, palette that has, uh, that has certain characteristics with regards to orientation. And, uh, you, you could almost fill in the entire picture black where there are mountains, where there are rocks. There are a lot of petroglyphs. They exist by the hundreds of millions. L let, me, let me start out by uh, talking about the Earth's aurora, uh, which is caused by Birkeland currents. Uh, uh, here's a view of the aurora borealis, uh, the northern aurora, there's a southern aurora, aurora australis, um, that don't occur at the same time. And, and, and this is seen in ultraviolet light by the uh, Viking uh, satellite. And here's an artist's depiction. I got this from um, John Hopkins Applied Research Laboratory, which sends uh, rockets up to, to uh, photograph this. And it shows the incoming, uh, incoming and, and outgoing Birkeland currents uh, that, are, uh, that originate with, a, with any kind of plasma that happens to enter the solar system or with an intense solar burst. You, you've got this plasma interacting with the with the Earth's dipole magnetic field, and at the uh, north magnetic pole and south magnetic pole, those are called horns. And there's holes. The magnetic field comes in, and the plasma, the charged particles, the electrons and ions, are able to pour in, and they follow this cone shape, and to produce the aurora that we see. And this is the kind of aurora that we have today. Many astronomers, physicists, have uh, proposed, hypothesized, that at, at one time um, th there was an immense uh, solar outburst uh, from the sun, maybe 100,000 times what it is right now. Uh, Tommy Gold uh, was, was one of the first to suggest this, uh, this hypothesis, uh, which he printed in a, um, actually in a, in a Vatican paper of all, of all places. <laughs> and um, it has been followed up by other people. So uh, many physicists, many astronomers believe that uh, in the past, millennia ago, there was an intense solar outburst, and uh, so I'm going to pursue that. Now, the first thing I have to do is to teach you plasma physics. Okay, which is, uh, okay, this is the uh, Achilles heel. Uh, Whenever one has, when, whenever one has uh, a, a column of, of plasma, a straight column of plasma, um, it, it, it tends to pinch itself. And it is, uh, see on our side of the Atlantic, it's called a Z-pinch, here it's called a Z-pinch. A and it's a, one of the most common occurrences in, in space plasma in, in that you've got a, a current 
flowing in, in a direction and a current flowing in a direction uh, tends to produce its own uh, self-magnetic field which tends to periodically pinch in on the plasma and this is the uh, the basic concept for many fusion concepts uh, the um, the uh, Z machine at uh, Sandin National Laboratories, for example, or the earlier machines at Princeton and Los Alamos and, 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 and so on. So what I'm trying to get across here is one will get these, these pinches. Uh, in, the, in the laboratory, we use a number of ways to produce these pinches with, uh, with, uh, with megajoules of energies. We'll either use wires to totally strip and vaporize in, into a plasma Z pinch or in, inject a gas which will be fully ionized into a plasma column or, or Z pinch or a, um, or a, a very thin uh, a cylinder. And in all cases, um, the pinch is, is pinched. Uh, the experimentalists will, it, it will say, and I've taken pictures of these myself, between eight and 10, it's usually nine. Nine is the, is the number of these, of these bulges which we call plasmoids and they will contain their own circling current inside which again produces a di dipole field. Okay, so that's almost all you need to know about plasma physics. Have I forgotten anything? No, I don't think so. How big is this? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah uh, experimentally we have followed it over uh, 14 orders of magnitude uh, in size, uh, that includes um, uh, the uh, the uh, sun down to um, to uh, to uh, uh, centimeters in the laboratory. The uh, Nobel laureate uh, Hannes Alfein claimed that it scaled 20, 28 orders of magnitude out out to the Hubble distance. Okay, and it's it's been our experience. It doesn't matter if you have microamperes of current or 150 gigaamperes of current. Acts the same, nine. Nine, nine, nine. Nine's the number. And, and, and again, size, it can be ast ast astrophysical or, uh, or, or, or millimeters. Okay, now uh, there's a couple of other things. I have not finished teaching you plasma physics yet. And uh, so now I'm going to try and do so in, in about 30 seconds. Uh, the Nobel laureates uh, Shanda Sekar and uh, Enrico Fermi were the first to, um, to solve the, uh, what was called the st stability uh, condition of a, of, of a Z pinch. Here's the, uh, the nine uh, plasmoids, actually I've only drawn five or so here. And um, a very complicated mathematical papers, other people followed up. I, I think we were the first to uh, actually uh, graphically um, uh, pre present graphical representations of the instabilities in a, uh, in a 1981 uh, physical review uh, letters paper. And um, this is a, a sort of morphology and these are sort of the magnetic field lines and that, uh, that, that one gets in a configuration like this. And we're going to look at this in some detail with regards to petroglyphs. Uh, as the current increases, as you increase the current, uh, the pinches get larger and larger until these are actually pinched off and what you get are a stack of toroids. This is an experimental picture of the stack of toroids. This is the conceptual view of what we have, the nine, uh, the, uh, the nine toroids. And again, this occurs at any, any scale, or at least from 14 orders of magnitude proven and, and 28 orders of magnitude uh, hypothesized. What is an order of magnitude? Order of magnitude is 1 to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, 14 times. Okay. Um, and, and current pulses, the current flowing through one of these uh, plasma columns tends to be sporadic, like all uh, currents in, in space. And this causes different parts of the column as, this, as, as the pulse comes through. And in our case, we're using uh, one, one nanosecond uh, pulse. And it's like, what, what, what units do you use here? Do you, uh, are, you are you metric? Yes, sir. Yes. Metric? 
or in, or or are you, are you metric or English? <laughs> okay, okay. We 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 use we 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 use God's units. Um, light travels in in one nanosecond. Uh, light travels one king's foot length. Okay. So so I'm going to give it to you in. in feet and inches, like that, dollars. <clears throat> oh, oh, okay, so the, so, so the important thing is, is, is d d different things are going to be lit up whenever one sees a Z-pinch, and again, this can be any size. And uh, the size that I'm leading to is the size of that intense auroral funnel that millennia ago came into Earth. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is um, is look at the uh, the, the so-called I or Al morphology in that uh, in, in that that Z pinch. It looks something like this when you when you false color it and, and fill it in, and and then compare it uh, to what we call I mask petroglyphs around the world. This is Easter Island, a New Grange. Um, where else? Uh, this is in uh, California. This is actually a pictograph of the, 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 the uh, Chumash Indians. This is on the Columbia River Basin, which is very rich in eye masks, uh, as is British Columbia. It's Romania, Europe. Um, everywhere you find this classification of petroglyph. Okay, so that's one classification of petroglyph on that rock that, 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 that had everything. Okay, and if I blow this up, and again, this is the uh, this is a computer simulation. And then I start comparing it. Uh, this is a, a pictograph on 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 Thera Island in Greece. The the date is unknown. Um, again, I generated this picture circa 1981. This might be 1,800 years old or 2,000. Or I well, I don't know. I I don't have a date on this, but I I think one can possibly see the the uh, the uh, similarity between the two, and, and in fact, there's many more. You find these everywhere around the world. Here's um, it, as opposed to the eye masks. These are the so-called face mask uh, petroglyphs, and the ones I've shown here are from Greece, Africa, Australia, Venezuela, British Columbia, New Grange. Uh, giving it all sorts of names, okay. Uh, Oregon, New Mexico, Arizona, and Columbia. Uh, actually, I have some many thousands of these, and uh, they uh, are from uh, around the world. This is, uh, this is the, the mathematical solution of the um, Chandrasekhar uh, uh, Fermi equations as the pulse comes through, and one can look at the face masks and then compare, you know, what somebody might see, and, and it, it, it it depends on culture, of course, how they, how they interpreted it. But anyway, uh, it is a very popular uh, petroglyph worldwide. Are you uh, saying that they're seeing the Excuse me? Are you saying that they're seeing the uh, what, what they're seeing really is um, electrons in the presence of a magnetic field. Electrons in the presence of a magnetic field if, if the electrons are, are, are relativistic, produce synchrotron light, and what they were seeing was, was synchrotron light. And of course, man has been seeing synchrotron light from, from uh, Crab Nebula and so on for as long as man has been on, on Earth, so it's always been there. And a very, I'll show you a very bright synchrotron light. So that's what, that's what they're looking at. They're not looking at, at the magnetic field, per se. Okay, and this is a, um, this is an experimental uh, view cross section of this uh, conceptual uh, geometry, and these are uh, th this has got this has actually got nine nine pairs. The um, the most intense synchrotron radiation coming out where the plasma is most intense, which is at the edge of these donuts, as uh, shown in this picture here, and then lesser numbers here. And again, uh, this is found worldwide. Uh, the ladder and scorpion petroglyphs, uh, again, they, they're all over Ireland. has got a, a lot, every, every place has got a, a lot of these so-called uh, ladder 
uh, petroglyphs and also the uh, the uh, so-called uh, scorpion uh, petroglyphs are found all over and uh, what happens is uh, that these donuts, as the current increases, the donuts, the toroids in the column tend to flatten out. And, and then they start to warp as, as the current increases. So, so these original donuts now have, have flattened out. Uh, this one has remained the same, so it still, it still has these uh, eye-like features that one sees here in the petroglyph. This is uh, from Kayenta uh, on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. Um, they, some start to warp, in fact they're all going to start to warp at, at, at some point as the current increases and right now, uh, as I recall on this one, we're up to something like 14 mega amperes or so, headed up towards 25 mega amperes on a very large pulse power generator. Um, and at the top they, they start forming a, a flower-like <coughs> excuse me, structure. Where, uh, where, where sort of a, um, a bulb-like feature is forming and then the next one is going to close around and the next one's going to close around and then in this direction it's going to go, it's going to close around in this direction. This is a radiograph. Uh, this is a radiograph too. This is not cut off artificially. This is really the way it is. That's really the way it is of the ladder. Um, somebody complained about the quality of this radiograph. Um, a radiograph is not a photograph. It is uh, taken by means of a, a flash x-ray radiograph generator, which is very large, maybe of the order of 100 meters long or so. It costs 140,000 US dollars to get a picture like this, uh, which is done in, uh, in a fraction of a nanosecond or in picoseconds. And we put many, many of these, oh, and it has to be, a, it, we're looking through, different layers of metals, uh, steel and copper, other heavy metals, uh, and it has to be extracted. Um, the picture has to be extracted, and, and that's, that's, that's why it's so expensive. So it's not a photograph, but it, it still gives you an idea of what, uh, what is actually happening inside this chamber. And of course, the x-rays produced are lethal, and so everything is covered in lead, and people are kept a mile away, and so on. And, and a lot of these are done half a mile. Uh, down hole at the Nevada test site with drifts going out to keep people safe. Um, as the current continues to increase, it produces these mushroom sort of features. Here is an experimental um, mushroom sort of feature. Here is uh, uh, the same thing, so shown side on and then uh, slightly upward. And then one can find the equivalent in, in petroglyphs, these same morphologies. And here, here I've shown a few, but they're, again, they exist at least by the tens of thousands, probably millions, and, and, and everywhere. Um, well, not quite everywhere. At high latitudes, they're often not found. <coughs> Uh, the mirror, mirror image or, or stick figure. Now this is, is one of the most uh, uh, popular um, images that one finds in, 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 in petroglyphs. And, and Wall mentioned briefly uh, on this also as, as being uh, the, the, the thunderbolts of, of, the, of the god. This is uh, just one uh, Z-pinch radiograph where one can sort of see this. this. This is just one and we have to look at many before we can put together the, conce the conceptual image. This is conceptual image, obliquely conceptual image side on, and then these are the dense parts, these are the dense parts of the, of the, um, of the Z-pinch radiograph. And um, this, without the dots, is the most common petroglyph one, found, one finds around the world is called a, a stick figure or a, or a mirror image. Uh, rarer yet, but uh, quite informative to me, are the stick figures that have two dots on the side because that's what we, that's what we, we, we see in the, in the laboratory. The, uh, and again, this is in, in, uh, in light emission, light being bright along these points here. And uh, many, many cultures, here uh, have these. 
This again is from the conceptual from the ex experiment from the radiograph. Uh, Navajo. Uh, now I've I've picked out the double dots because it would be you know it's, how how do you explain something that looks like this? Well, you can say well they weren't very bright and their drawing uh, cap capacities were were very limited. But around the world they all did it the same way. But uh, if if you look for every well, between 100 and 500 of the regular stick figure images, you see the one with the, with the double dots. And here I've picked out uh, those uh, from, uh, from the Navajo Reservation, Armenia, uh, Guyana, an area that we're surveying right now. Uh, here's the one I found in, in New Mexico that is not five miles from my house. One in Spain, here's one in China, in, uh, in, in, uh, th this one is in Val Camonica in Italy, uh, United Arab Emirates, an another one from, Val from Val Camonica, and this is another one I discovered in uh, the southern part of uh, Arizona uh, near Tucson. But uh, again, you find these by great numbers, but, but they are rare, rarer. So, so, so now one, what I'm trying to convey to you is that panel that looked totally incoherent or looked like mad people, maybe eating the local cactus or, or whatever, uh, drew, of course they would, maybe they had the same cactus around the world, which I doubt, because they all drew the same thing around the world. Uh, so I'm starting, trying to start to pick out the different pictures that they drew on this, on, on this rock. And it's completely over, overdrawn, and I'll show you why it's overdrawn. This is uh, a dog in Africa, a, a Dogon ceremony, uh, which is carried on to get to the gay. The, uh, the Aboriginal peoples are very, very good, actually, as are we, in uh, preserving what is sacrosanct, what is sacrosanct as uh, being sacrosanct. You do not change the shape of it. If you have a cross, you, you don't suddenly decide to, you know, decide to change the shape of a cross into something else. You keep it the way it's been handed down to you. And, and here you can see in their ceremonies, and this is today, the stick figures. This is called a, a, a Siggy headdress. And one can, I think there's probably nine here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, maybe nine, okay. And it, it's got the, uh, again, this might be uh, uh, visualized his, his eyes up here in the crossing. There, there, were, there was an X crossing here, which, uh, and I, I don't know if I'm going to show you those figures, but, but anyway, there's these figures that, uh, that show up. Um, so they continue to hand down the, these icons uh, with, with, very, with very little change. Uh, he's dancing around and um, same sort of dance that's done by uh, the uh, powwow in, in Albuquerque, which is about uh, two hours uh, f from my house, the, the All Nations powwow, Indian powwow. And, um, and they dance around, uh, usually with ego's feather, in, in a certain way, and, and I'm gonna show you uh, why, the, why it's done like that. Uh, one cannot talk about Petra, has, has everybody heard of Cocapelli? No. Has anybody heard of Cocapelli? Okay. Okay. Walls heard of Cocapelli. <laughs> okay. Cocapelli is a, is, a, is a very popular folk figure in uh, places like uh, New Mexico, Arizona, the southwestern United States, um, also in places, uh, places like Afghanistan and uh, other places around the world. It, it's, it's generally considered a, a mischievous, Africa, uh, a mischievous uh, sort of a figure playing a flute. And it, may be, it may be a flute, it may be something else. It depends on the, how the culture interpreted what they saw in the synchrotron light in the very bright aurora coming into the sky. Here's the plasma images of the flute playing figure and this is uh, this is from the American Southwest here, many different styles. Again, playing the flute, Southwest. This is Af Africa playing the flute. Colombia, well, that might be a flute, I don't know. Uh, 
This again, uh, this is from the southwest because of the duck head, which often appears. This is in Russia. Uh, Siberia is very Siberia is very rich in petroglyphs, and uh, Sri Lanka, uh, something something similar, interpreted by by their culture. <clears throat> okay, moving right on because I've got to move right on. Uh, a very popular petroglyph that one finds is that of a bighorn uh, a sheep in the southwest. Well, not just in the southwest, American southwest, but in, in, in many different places. I've, I've taken these from California, and uh, but they're but you find them in other parts of the world too. And uh, what what happens when you have this intense aurora coming in, uh, interacting with the a atmosphere? A series of instabilities develop that are not Zeepian's instabilities, but instabilities associated with the shock of the of the atmosphere, and it produces these sort of figures. And uh, and prehistoric man, I, I mean, you can easily imagine. Uh, I mean, what can you relate this to? Well, you, you can relate this to a. Uh, to a um, to a, to a bighorn sheep, which is what they did. Um, did they also draw them in a way? They, they knew perfectly well the anatomy of what a big bighorn sheep and what it looked like because they had them hanging in camp. That was one of their prime sources of food. They knew very well. That's not the way they drew them. They drew them like the plasma instabilities. Very close, but that's. Quite the way they drew them. This is the country, uh, the kind of country that uh, that we work with in um, in uh, logging uh, petroglyphs. This is uh, a, again an instability that develops once the uh, once the uh, the donut has flattened out. It flattens out in waves, and then it starts curling in. This and. Petroglyphs are oriented. Around the world, they are oriented. Um, and they are oriented magnetic. This is a magnetic south uh, needle. It's oriented magnetic south. Um, this magnetic south is right behind this edge. And I, I, I call that a knife edge or a blinder because the center of the plasma column was coming in magnetic south right into the uh, south magnetic full, synchrotron radiation, very bright, and almost every petroglyph has got a blinder of some sort in front of it, something that shields out the center so you can see what's happening on the outside where the instabilities are, and the instabilities are on the outside. So at this location, I'm, I'm actually back in a cave, and the petroglyphs are back in the cave here. This is looking south, and it's got this. This is a typical feature. Uh, here, the, the same thing. Uh, magnetic south is this way. It not only has the mountain off uh, off to the distance, uh, about 90 miles or how many kilometers that is, uh, and but it has this this knife edge. And this area, this whole area here, is filled with petroglyphs. As soon as you go around the bend, no petroglyphs. Same rocks, no petroglyphs whatsoever. Then they are oriented magnetic south. So we so we know which direction the um, intense. Aurora came in. This is an, an escarpment of uh, some 7,500 uh, petroglyphs, which I uh, uh, surveyed in. Um, this is below Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, see, this is a, a marker line that I use them with my GPS unit as a as a as a, as a, um, as, as, a as a calibrator on the road that exists. And uh, the different colors are different sweeps that I made through this area. This is an, an escarpment here about uh, 100, 100 feet high or so. And what is important, uh, Magnetic South is here. And you find petroglyphs whenever there was a view of towards Magnetic South, but kind of shielded. Here's Magnetic South and kind of shielded by the escarpment. And where it turns, now these rocks are exactly the same as these rocks, exactly the same as these rocks. Uh, you found a, a, a few concentrics and a few spirals, which are the highest part of the configuration uh, here, but abs this is absolutely void of petroliths, where these are overdrawn. They may be overdrawn three times down here. And then, and now a mountain range gets in the way down here and, and, it, and it stops. 
So you, so you lose that magnetic south. This is a petrified uh, uh, forest in, uh, in Arizona. This is a, uh, this is a, a topograph with the logging uh, points of uh, petroglyphs on it. And this is a, a three-dimensional view. And um, the, the marks are, of course, petroglyph magnetic south. This is going off uh, in this direction. I think it's about 11 degrees at, at this latitude. And, or, and, and location. Um, and then they stop. There are few up here, few here. And what happens is it, there, there's a, a mountain range to the south that blocks out the view. And, and in fact, these will trace, they will actually silhouette the mountain off, off to the south. But this mountain range then blocks it off. And, and even though these rocks are just as good as, as, as here, there are, are no petroglyphs because of that blockage. This is uh, Petroglyph Side in Donner Pass, uh, Sierra Nevada, California. Uh, great historical interest uh, uh, to those who uh, study the, uh, the High Sierras. And uh, the petroglyphs are, are located so, uh, so that it has a, uh, this is the blue line is, is uh, magnetic south. And even those, when you're there, it's very hard to tell in the, in the field that there is, is a preference whatsoever because the mountains are so high. They're, uh, they're 14, there's uh, 14,000 feet, divide by pi and you'll get meters, I guess. Um, so, uh, so, so uh, standing here and looking at the petroglyphs, you cannot tell, you really cannot tell that there's a gap until you put it down on, on a three-dimensional area or, or a three-dimensional topograph time after time. And it's magnetic south. Here's the same thing. Here's a site in southern Arizona. This is near Tucson. Uh, the Cocorachi, famous Cocorachi, Axis Mundi uh, petroglyph, which is a, uh, again, the, the uh, flattened uh, donuts coming around like this, a very beautiful figure. Uh, these are the w ones I've logged. And, and at the time I was logging, there was this big mountain here. Couldn't tell, couldn't tell. And then I found some over on a rock over here. And, but when I put it down on a 3D uh, aerial, it is immediately apparent this is magnetic south. That uh, again, they're looking magnetic south. And of course, we have, I don't know, three or four or 400 of these like this right now. Actually, more data. But uh, this is uh, a very difficult site uh, to get to. These, uh, it, it's an aerial map, but it's contoured at, um, at uh, 20, 20 feet contours. So it, it looks nice and, and smooth. Well, uh, I, I went in with uh, Professor Marvin Rowe, who is, uh, I, I believe, probably the world's uh, expert on dating pictographs. Um, and uh, we made our way in there. It took us all day and all day to get out. Very, very rough country. But if you move a foot in some places, the difference is 400 feet down. So, uh, um, and, and again, there's a channel down here. There's a channel down here, which we could see at the site. Uh, this is a 10 kilometer uh, long canyon. This is the Rio Grande River. This is in, in New Mexico. Uh, this is an area that I've explored uh, pretty extensively. These petroglyphs that go along here go along, uh, uh, silhouette the, the mountain, the mountains in front, uh, directly magnetic south to them. Um, and there's one, there's, well, there's about three. One little place up here in this canyon uh, that has a magnetic south view, uh, you find some petroglyphs. Let, let me show you, this, this, again, this is it's very precipitous. That's, that's what it looks like, really. The waterfall here, and uh, I'm going to show you where the petroglyphs are in a minute, but one has to come down on the side here and snake around and come down. And it's very, uh, very difficult, very dangerous uh, country to tra traverse. Um, this is looking down towards the Rio Grande. And it turns out the petroglyphs are right in here where it can look off magnetic south. Look off Magnetic South with no interruption by mountains here or mountains over here. It's got a very narrow uh, Magnetic South uh, field of view. Uh, probably see part of the trail going down here. That's the Rio Grande, which means big river. It's about that wide. 
Okay. Uh, this is a map of the Alpine uh, rock art sites, uh, the, the sites that uh, I have most uh, recently uh, logged include the, uh, it's uh, supposedly the largest uh, petroglyph site in, uh, in Europe, and this is at uh, Val Camonica, Val, the, the Camonica Valley in, uh, in uh, Italy. Uh, Bergamo is over here, Milano is somewhere yeah, here. And uh, as I said, there's about 300,000 there, and uh, of course we didn't individually log them all, but we log, log the, the rocks that they're, they're on and uh, then put them on uh, maps. Now what surprised me was when, when I was at Valcamonica, it appeared, again, the mountains on either side uh, went up nine, 10,000 feet and you have this very narrow valley as you're looking down towards the, the Mediterranean. And it looked to me like they were looking directly magnetic south. But when I put this on a, on a 3D contour, they're doing the same thing that they do in Arizona, New Mexico, or, uh, or uh, elsewhere, is they're tending to put them where they, they have some sort of blinder, some sort of shield. They, these are actually down a little bit, so, so, they, so the rock has got all kinds of inscriptions, but there's a little bit of, 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 of a blind. Same thing here, they're following the uh, the uh, the contours to uh, to uh, block out that intense synchrotron light that is coming in from directly magnetic south. Here's magnetic south. This one right here is way off to the side, but it, it, there's a cut in the valley here that allows it to to uh, to uh, look magnetic south. Uh, area that uh, right now I've got a great deal of data. Uh, the Dutch in, in Suriname, I, I suppose, having nothing better to do and being the Dutch as they are. Uh, there's a lot of petroglyphs there on the river so they put latitudes and longitudes on them. They, instead of collect, uh, people collect butterflies and, and they did this. So, so it, it, it's a great, uh, great deal of data, valuable data for, for me that uh, it probably has been overlooked by, by everybody else or not considered valuable by anybody else, I, I should say. And that includes uh, French Guiana, Suriname uh, Guiana, uh, part of Venezuela, I've been down part of this, but I have not been in here, but, uh, and uh, what have I left out? Well, anyway. This is in Suriname. This is a boulder, and it's fill a, big, a big boulder, and it's filled with petroglyphs, and it has a, a nice view right down this channel, this, uh, this natural channel in the land, the magnetic south. And, uh, and, and you have to go quite a ways before you find, um, more petroglyphs. Here, here's another, another place. Again, this is, this is a rock out, and it's out in the river, and it, it has a field of view that is magnetic south. Now, many petroglyphs have a, a, a total field of view. You can look in all directions, but if the magnetic south is not there, there's no petroglyphs. This is another point, again, where the anomaly of the river allows a straight magnetic south view. This, again, in Suriname. And now we go to a little island <laughs> close to Borneo, I think. <laughs> and uh, I, I really have to thank my Australian uh, friends who uh, load up my emails uh, by sending me ton, tons of data. <coughs> and right now, the area in South Australia, I'm getting a lot of data from uh, sites in here. Uh, up here at the, in the Kimberleys, uh, the Winjana Gorge, I'm getting uh, data. And uh, and other there's a lady that is uh, actually traveling somewhere somehow somewhere here and, and, and taking logging information and, and contributing it, it all very valuable data. This is Akaru Rock, and again we have the same thing. Uh, petroglyphs over here. There's a shield. There's a knife edge shield. A blinder here, and there's magnetic south. Uh, this is Sacred Canyon, and again we have the same thing. Uh, now, there is, now there is an opening to the east, and we have some question: Is are they looking partially east? And it depends on the inclination that you look up the column, what instability you see. And so we're uh, we're logging that that data. But uh, again, we have the magnetic uh, south uh, field of view. This is the Urimbala Caves. 
same thing. These are in caves back in here. Uh, there's, there's, there's a shield and the, about the only field of view is, would be something like this, something like this, and here's Magnetic South. Uh, and we're trying to get data at Tasmania, for example. Uh, this is at uh, something like uh, 33 degrees or so, and Tasmania gets down to 40 degrees, and we'd like to get some, uh, some uh, petroglyphs there as well as from uh, a few other parts of the world that have uh, very large southerly latitudes, as well as determine what is the maximum uh, northerly latitude. This is Mount Chambers Petro Petroglyph Galley particularly fine example of the petroglyphs here and again only having I mean there's no view there's no, no north view there's no east view there's no west view there's only a magnetic uh, uh, south view here okay concentric and spiral petroglyphs mapping and incoming aurora okay uh, I don't know if I mentioned this I probably didn't mention this uh, when you have a thin uh, plasma column the tendency for the thin plasma column uh, is to filament into uh, 56 uh, individual uh, currents. We, we call them 56 Birkeland currents. And again, the number is 56, uh, regardless of the, uh, the current or the size. And when you look at, now when you watch the, the time evolution of the, of the uh, once the cylinder has, has filamented up, I'll show some pictures of that, um, it, it goes through some interesting motions. Here, here's, here's two adjacent ones. Uh, they come together. Uh, most often they, they start to spiral around each other before coming together. Uh, th this one is undergoing some, some rotation itself. And so we start with, I think I, I have 20 or so, not 56 here. But it, it goes something like that. And they get fatter each time because they're forming vortices, so they're kind of you know, square-shaped. Or, or many people um, liken these to animals. So when you look at uh, many uh, replications or, or petroglyphs or pictographs from uh, antiquity, these will be drawn as animals because you can you know, sort of see a tail or, or something you can imagine like that. And it goes down in number until you get to four. And, and it ends at four. So the 56 finally end at four. <clears throat> Which is important. Uh, now we've, done, we've looked at this both with uh, supercomputer simulations to determine that indeed 56 is a number and 56 is a number uh, as you make the, the cylinder thinner and thinner uh, the number of filaments goes up to 56 where each one has got an individual pinching magnetic field. If you go beyond that, the magnetic fields kind of come together and, uh, and you don't get 128 or, or so, you get, you get 56. Uh, this is a 17 kiloampere beam, a charge, uh, intense uh, relativistic charged particle beam that has, uh, uh, this is a steel witness plate that is uh, some meters uh, away from the uh, device itself. The periodicity of, the, and I've outlined these marks so that you can see, and the periodicity, again, is uh, 56. This is work that, that, has been, that has all been published. That's just plasma physics. Okay, so, so there are 56 Birkeland filaments in our intense aurora that happened perhaps four millennia ago. So, okay, so now we start searching for, uh, for concentrics that have either 56 rays or, or dots. Uh, here's one on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona in the United States. We start going, going around the world. Next one we go to Australia. This is near Derby, Australia. This is uh, in the Wingina uh, Gorge. And again, it uh, has uh, 56 rays coming out. Uh, on top of this is another 50, a larger 56 uh, rayed um, uh, petroglyph, but it has uh, blobs or, or dots on, on the end. And, and one finds that number all over. Now these are, here is Derby, Australia. Here is uh, uh, Winslow, Arizona. And you take the two, and if you tilt 
the Australian one by about 45.3 degrees. You can overlay it. Uh, it's very hard to overlay it. It's very hard to overlay it to distinguish one from the other because they are so precise. In fact, to do so, I had to emboss the Arizona one and then put down the Australian one in black just to differentiate the two. They're so exact, and yet they're that far apart, which is typical. These occur by the hundreds around the world. There's many more than that. 56 filament dot concentrics. Oh, 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 okay. So we've got a huge data bank on, on, on a supercomputer. And the idea then is to uh, go through and find every 56 uh, point uh, symmetric uh, concentric, you know, that exists if we can. Uh, and this one is uh, uh, what's called the four o'clock rapids, 56 uh, concentric. Actually, it's less than that because these have started to undergo rotation. They have started to, as Birkeland filaments, they have started to rotate around each other. You can see the rays coming out there. And so on the computer, what we will do is, is generate blind rings. That is, I will draw a ring through each of the uh, major features on this uh, Columbia River uh, petroglyph, and now I'm going to go through and, and ask the computer to compare this to, to uh, all sorts of concentrics that I have. Maybe brass brass plates, and maybe other uh, items from antiquity. It can be uh, uh, well, we collect items from antiquity and include that also. I'm trying to think what else we include. We include a great many things, not just petroglyphs. And so that's what we're trying to match, or uh, 56. Uh, some sort of 56 symmetry. The first one we come up with um, is only 17 miles away from the uh, from the blind ring one. So I mean that's uh, so you might say, well, uh, the same artist just moved downstream and, and chipped away, except there except there are uh, differences in this that they they both like 56 for some reason. The next one is uh, in Arizona. This is on, again on the Navajo Nation, and one sees the uh, the 56 rays coming out and the match of the uh, of the blind rings that we search. This uh, again is from Washington State. This is a, a pictograph, and again it matches the uh, the feature. It has uh, as uh, less than 56, but the concentric blind rings uh, picked it up. Um, bronze shield, third millennium, Middle East. Again, it picked this one up. Uh, this is a 56 ray from Kazakhstan. Uh, it's 56 rays. It, it doesn't have the inner concentric uh, rings. Okay. Uh, somebody locked the doors because at this point people are going to start escaping. But this is a 56 ray circle axis mundi from uh, China. And these are actually drawn as uh, paintbrushes. You know, the axis uh, mundi uh, here, the tree coming up in the center. But anyway, the 56 are there. Uh, this one I've forgotten where it is, but again it has a 56 rays. Uh, that one again is in um, in uh, uh, Arizona. It says same thing. Pick that one up. Uh, this is unfair. I picked the penumbra of a dense plasma focus, which also has 56, but it's a plasma, so we, we would expect it to have 56, and it does. Uh, dome ceiling, Fifth Street uh, Church, uh, Seattle. This is uh, very close to the uh, Forbidden City of China. Uh, ceiling picture, these ceiling pictures show up and they uh, generally have uh, 56 uh, uh, periodicity around the side. So if people remembered this and it's sacrosanct and they continue to use it over and over again. This is brand new. This is the uh, 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 Grand Atrium in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, which is brand new. And uh, again, they, they didn't draw it circular, but they certainly put uh, uh, eight times seven uh, panels of light around here as well as some structure in, in the center. Uh, again, carrying it on. The, the Aborigines today will produce pictures that might as well be, have been drawn, might as well be petroglyphs that are 4,000 years old, and they'll do it today. That, that's how accurate it is. That's uh, Neolithic stone ruins. This is the uh, Canelo village, uh, north central Brazil. Has uh, very interesting. They uh, have these uh, 56 avenues coming out and, uh, and a house, a village house on, on each side. 
uh, like that. Anybody want to look at that Neolithic stone ruins again? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, yes, so uh, excuse me. Yeah, it's Aubrey. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh I, Aubrey. Aubrey. Yeah, okay. Now you have to pronounce it right. <laughs> I have to use English here. Um, okay, so, so, so this, is, this is what it looks like today or whenever they took the picture. Um, actually, I, I visited the place before uh, they put the, the fence around. Uh, I'm going to go back there. Okay, finish this thing up. Uh, which is a nice, it's not the biggest, uh, it's not the most accurate, but it's nice. <laughs> okay, so, so what we're going to do is, we're, first off, we're, we're, we're going to uh, accept the accepted reconstruction of Stonehenge. Um, as it is believed, it's thought we're not going to put in extra stones or whatever. Where they were, they were, and, um, and simply use it. And then overlay it on the. This is overlaid on the on the on the Navajo uh, uh, petroglyph, and one can see the sort of matchup that ones have, and do this with with several several hundred of these. So there, <laughs> this configuration was seen around the world. How long, and how long was it seen for? How, how, to be able to count that there were fifty six. Must I, have been seen for a long time, so that they. Uh, yeah, wait. millennia. Yeah, I, I think I, I think their number, uh, it's their dating is <laughs> the uh, English uh, Heritage Foundation. Uh, they use something like 14 deer antlers, carbon 14 dating, and deer well, antlers I, are. I mean, are not not um, Stonehenge, but how long was this object seen oh. in the sky? So people were. Able uh, to as far as far as I can tell, about a millennia, about oh. a millennia to go from 56 to four. I see. And they were able they, to count it. But they they had, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they, they had good telescopes and good eyesight because, because they, were, they were able to see it. Um, and, um, and, and, and do a very, a very good, uh, a very good uh, job like, based on what everybody else uh, drew, too. Not drew, drew and constructed in any number of ways, uh, many, many ways far beyond the hundred that I'm talking about here, uh, ways of of reproducing what they what they saw in the sky. This is uh, an overlay on the uh, on the Forecock uh, Rapids uh, petroglyph. Uh, here we can we can start to see the uh, the rotation of the um, of the Birkeland filaments. That is not shown in, in Stonehenge, but nevertheless the the overlay is, uh, is 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 quite well, and you start to see, which is what we see in the laboratory. We start to see these go off, and they and as I showed in that one picture, they go off until eventually they come down to four. So how does a 56 filament Z pinch evolve? I think I probably already showed you this. Okay, and now all. Now I'm trying to explain each and every one of the petroglyphs that I showed you on that panel. That looked like garbage when I started. Okay, but I haven't shown you all the petroglyphs that are, that are on the panel or, or elsewhere. Okay, and, and here we have petroglyphs that look like this. I, I mean, it, it, the people either have to be mad. Actually, you can see the origins of the of the American Indian headdresses and and, and other headdresses uh, dr drawn around the world in the in the petroglyphs. So where so where did these come from? Well, as this uh, intense aurora comes in, again it goes through these these pinches, and you get several of the these plasmoids out there as it funnels in, and then you have these 56 filaments coming around, and what gave them the idea? Oh well, first okay, I have to say something about auroras. And, and the reason I have to say something about auroras is because I, I've edited uh, uh, six or seven journals on uh, magnetospheric uh, physics, so I can talk about auroras. I, there's other things that some of you know about that uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to publish. But anyway, um, here's the Earth down here. Here's the uh, what is pictured to be today's uh, 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 plasma coming in from a uh, from a solar. Storm on both the uh, south and uh, north uh, poles. Now we know this one came in only on the south, but anyway, it, it forms the, these plasmoids. So if you're into auroras, that's that's important. If you're into something else, well, that's important too. <laughs> and so, 
So we will draw a picture of this uh, aurora, of the aurora cone being pinched and coming in. And uh, one starts to get an idea of what the people what the people were up to when they were drawing figures like that, and why they why it is double brain like that. It's always double brain, and sometimes with dots, but it usually has this double ray structure. And so we're looking back up at this at the morphology of this intense aurora, and and I think that that these are. 56 filaments. Again, they were, they've reduced now to 28, and they're going to come down to uh, they're going to come down to four. Okay. What other evidence to, is there to support this? Um, the, the, this is something that was just pointed out to me. This is a very bad picture. This is a, a vessel from of ore, which is um, uh, currently on display at the uh, University of Pennsylvania Museum of uh, Archaeology and Anthrop Anthropology that is helping to support this work, and. Um, very poor picture. They promised me a better picture, but it didn't. It didn't come in time. And uh, Ur is, is in uh, the Middle East, and uh, th this is thought to be third millennia sort of uh, uh, vessel from the uh, excavations, the archaeological excavations. Down here, you can't see it very well. Is an eight-petal design, which, uh, which which really gives it away. I'm not going to show you an eight-petal design because I wasn't smart enough to go from the 56 down to the, eventually down to the 8, down, down to the 4. I started with something, I started with 56 and then I left out stuff and then I started again with, with a lesser, lesser number, but I can go out back to 8 pretty, uh, pretty simply. Okay, and the final morphology for a 56 Birkeland uh, filament uh, cylinder is the 4 shown here. Here's the 4 remaining Birkeland currents these are the magnetic uh, fields, the synchrotron emitting magnetic fields around the outside of each one of these. These are at two different times, two different times here. And so what are the petroglyphs that, that match this? Well, uh, Mesoamerica has got the large, uh, th th this SLA is called a kinkun. Kinkun. Okay. And this is the, the uh, most reproduced petroglyph in, in Mesoamerica, although you find it everywhere. The museum has got some very good examples from the East and the Middle East, uh, Mediterranean countries. There's also some, uh, I photographed myself, some very good ones in Valcamonica as well as Arizona, New Mexico and so on. And uh, so one has got uh, this sort of, th this is trapped, trapped plasma that is being heated up by these currents pushing in, being heated up very bright as are these very bright. Here and then uh, in this configuration, uh, here again uh, shows up. This this is the final configuration. Uh, at this point, the plasma snaps and it's gone. That's it. So I hope that uh, I think that's that's my last one. Uh, conclusions. Okay, petroglyphs not only uh, carry the orientation of an intense synchrotron light emitting column coming into the Earth's south uh, magnetic pole uh, in prehistory. And again, dating is very, very hard, perhaps four millennia ago, but I'm not sure. Uh, but also the complete temporal evolution graphically. In other words, one can take these petroglyphs of one, one type, put them all together and make a movie of the evolution, just as one does with the supercomputer simulation. That's what's contained in it. Uh, also, the orientation and the petroglyph, as you look at it from different angles of inclination, give you the figure of what was in the sky. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
supports a scenario that I need to look at. I am so. suggesting that the Stonehenge arrangement really has nothing to do with the moon and things like that. No. And it would be pretty simple no. to get it. No. I, I mean, uh, um, you know, that, that's the, the popular. You're starting at 56, and it's easy to get to 28, and then the, the, okay, the lunar uh, cycle, and, and so on. So, and be, so, so if you look at just Stonehenge and say, what is it, without knowledge of the several million of other things around the world, th then yeah, you can turn it into a clock, you can turn it into uh, into a calendar, you can turn it into whatever. Uh, you know, certain things, the hillstone. You know, it's a, about four degrees off, which, yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty good, but there should be one on the other side, there's not. Uh, there, there's a number of things that have kind of been, kind of been fudged to, to, uh, by the uh, astro-archaeological uh, group. They've done that in, um, in, uh, in Utah. There's some con concentrics in Utah, and they've kind of fudged the angles a little bit. But, but they're very, very isolated. And uh, why would you uh, hew out and carry 75 miles, 45 ton or 75, 45 for uh, Stonehenge, uh, a very 75 ton uh, rocks, just to uh, just to tell you when the uh, the uh, winter solstice uh, was. I mean that's an enormous and, and oh and, and and to dig the barrels around enormous around work and not just there but around the world at one time there was an enormous amount of work went in at, at one particular time, all over a millennia, uh, around the world. I, I have tried to make petroglyphs twice. I can't do it. I don't have the time, I don't have the patience, the sun is hot, and you're making noise. You, you just can't do it. Yet they ship these things, you know, four centimeters deep mm -hmm. in, in places. Uh, so, so like Stonehenge, what, what would drive you to use your gross national product to produce these items, and it's not just Stonehenge, it's many items around the world that just happened to overlay on Stonehenge. So uh, I think Wall probably gave you uh, a very good clue. He drew that uh, body in the background with the lightning coming down. That lightning is lethal. It's gigaampers of lightning coming down. Uh, we know from laboratory experiments that uh, intense amounts of x-rays, which are lethal, are produced for tens of kilometers around the um, around the uh, lightning bolts, and then for 100 kilometers, uh, sores will develop on the skin. I suppose, that, what else can you do, you know, but to draw pictures of the, maybe the gods or, or whatever to make it go away? Uh, the petroglyphs on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the cliffs, for example, you can't see from the bottom. You can only see from the top. Which is why you have to step somebody to the top, somebody to the bottom, and, and like that. And they're, they're not made for man, for your neighbors to look at. They're made for the, they're somebody in the sky. The, they're far away from human habitation, from what I've seen. They're far away from the nearest village. Yeah. Welcome, Monica. You've got oh. to climb and climb and climb. Oh, and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. An, 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 another, another myth is, uh, yeah, you need to be near, near Pueblo. You need to be near water. Uh, no, no, absolutely not. You only have to have very good granite that has a, a uh, at least one component of, of magnetic south and some kind of blinder, and they went to enormous lengths, enormous amounts of work, because these are in very remote areas. Uh, the, the most prodigious number of uh, petroglyphs, probably in the states of, in the United States, uh, the states of uh, Nevada and Utah, for the most part, uninhabitable. Uh, I've logged out there when it's 106, 106 degrees. Fahrenheit, whatever that is, in uh, centigrade, whatever you use. I think it's divided by pi again or something. Um, um, and, and, and you're just, you're, you're photographing, I photograph on digital and, and on, on, on CDs and so I can take a lot and drinking water. It's just terribly hot, just terribly hot, terribly in hospital. What, now the weather may not have been like that four millennia ago. P -p probably wasn't, but what? Uh, what caused man to carve it's centimeters so deep? Oh, and, and, and then some, yes, uh, some you can only get through from ropes and, and, and so on. I, I mean, they put their lives at, at stake to, to do that. Uh, some are uh, hundreds of feet up. Uh, 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 you know, you're up there and, and hanging on and you're looking down, you know, 100 feet or 200 feet or so. 
So, so what drove Man to, to do that? And uh, uh, I, th I think Walt's picture gave you a, a pretty good idea. Of this these lightning bolts were striking Earth, and uh, people were either being killed by the X-rays, incinerated, vitrified, or covered, you know, or made very sick. Are you saying that the lightning bolts happened at the same time as the Yeah, button? yeah, because it's it, yeah, because. There's there's one thing in common with uh, petroglyphs around the world, is they have the uh, torosity symbols, the lightning bolt symbols, uh, next to them, and you'll see a figure, and then it will have a jagged lightning bolt going over to another figure, and so on. That's that's that that's universal, and uh, the, the only thing that I know of that has a tor a torosity like that is a uh, intense uh, electrical discharge, either in the laboratory or in the sky. I'm just wondering how they would have seen it. In the northern hemisphere, given the yeah. arc of the Earth, yeah, and given that auroras are not very high, uh, and so the this Earth would interfere out, with the yeah. yeah. It, it, this is a very intense aurora, and, uh, and I, I, I believe it went out something like uh, 170,000 uh, kilometers, and I'm not sure about that distance. It uh, went. A ways it's, it's, out there because, the and, 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 and that is the reason for logging the world and also getting inclination because where was it? And, and, and the fact that this, this one, that the wind jhana that overlays the, the Navajo is tilted at 45 degrees, that gives you, you know, some indication of where it is. But it's not just that. I mean, we've got several hundred examples that. that so have you been going to this no, we're, it, 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 no I, I need more data, uh, especially from the. Uh, from the far south, uh, because uh, no, we have yeah we have pinpointed the the lower the lower part, but uh, but but some of the interesting structure is way out there, and uh, and that's data that's uh, that we're gathering right now and, and processing. It's like looking for the end of the rainbow. Yeah, it's like it's looking at the end of the rainbow. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, except this is yeah. Yeah, that's exactly where it was. Yeah, there's a tendency from South American data and also from Australian data that it went out south and then it bends up to the up to the east. But it was clearly, I mean, it's clearly seen as, as symmetrical from Stonehenge, uh, other places at at, la, at, uh, at latitudes between 56 degrees and uh, and about the same. No, I don't know the same south because I've only got. Uh, 33 degrees to the south, and it's tilted there. But anyway, uh, northern South America, I have pretty. Uh, China, it, it's oh, uh, uh, Thailand, Thailand, Burma, China, China was not on all, all of these places. China was empty on your map. I noticed that. No, no, no. Well, I'm looking, looking for empty places because that will tell me, like, if if they if there is uh, some uh, delineation uh, mark, some uh, mark at. Uh, Let's say 60 degrees latitude north, and then something south. That that helps to tell me the the field of view. Now, since oh, okay, this took no great Euclid to figure out because I'd already seen this in the laboratory. Okay, so you know all I got to do is duh. You know I've seen it in the laboratory, so now and now I see the petroglyphs. So so I match it to the ones in the laboratory, and I can see where it's off angle. And then that off angle then gives me an idea of what they were looking at where. And then this uh, allows you to uh, to produce. It. It's kind of like a um, it's kind of like a, a hologram, where you have a bunch of pixels and you're able to get a 3D image if you have enough pixels. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's it's very close to that. So it's a matter of getting enough pixels to uh, to resolve what they actually saw. Is yes. The fact that the petroglyphs in the British Isles are dominated by the spirals and the eyes. Yeah. But you don't see any stick. Men. No, you don't see any stick men, which is the lower, lower, uh, yes, yeah, 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 further down, and, and it's just, I mean, the number of stick men is just uh, enormous, uh, at least uh, at lower, at lower latitudes, uh, but in the British Isles, um, Argyle and and, uh, and some of the places like that, you, you don't find any, you don't find any, no stick men whatsoever. I've got several books on the British Isles of various petroglyphs, and Ian has contributed immensely by providing actual uh, GPS uh, locations for some of these and uh, so far they're indicating uh, southern southern view, southern magnetic south view. Uh, most of the myths seem to be pointing towards seeing yeah. something in the north. Yeah, I know that. 
I, I know that. Uh, now, now mythology is uh, it's very accurate. It's for, uh, now, how do I know it's very accurate? Because I'm not a mythologist. Well, okay, they, so they tell the story, these stories around the world of what followed what. Yeah, this is the way, this is the way it goes in the laboratory. This goes first, then this goes first, and then this goes first, and so on. And yeah, that, that's what happens. Uh, so, so I know the mythology is very accurate, but there is this, um, we saw it in the north, over and over again, we saw it in the north. We saw it in the north. And, uh, and now, s some of the mythologists are in, that are in the group, uh, uh, maybe you know where his, his talk here, uh, Renz uh, Vandersloos, uh, claims that the north was either celestial north or straight up. Straight up might be north. And, it, and, and to my thinking, right now it looks like it might be straight up, not the north pole as we know it today. Because none, none of the petroglyphs not <laughs> any crevices, you know, you hear the rattling behind you in the crevices. And, uh, and you're looking out straight magnetic south, and it's not, and you can't see north, or you're up against a, a cliff that goes way up there, you know, 100 meters up, and, and, and you can't see north, but you, but you can't see south. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's one of the puzzles. That, that's one of the puzzles. What, what is north? And, and Ren's, uh, it went into this in some detail that uh, it's probably up, probably up, which makes a lot of sense. And I haven't shown you the eclipsed uh, part of the concentrics, which are, are seen in large numbers uh, to the north, where only half of it was seen. The same thing is true in Australia, uh, which gives uh, some idea that, uh, that they couldn't see the whole thing. Now, they certainly could at Stonehenge, but further north. Uh, Anyway, that's all. This is a work in progress. Okay. Is this work yes. published or is it being published? I, the, the, yeah, this is all, all being published. Uh, I, and a, again, as I said, it's being published under the auspices of, um, of the, the field that I work in, high energy density plasma physics. So it's appearing in the physics and engineering journals. Uh, like that, as is the Stonehenge. No, the thing you see when you have an article uh, coming out in the uh, journal, uh, the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. So, uh, the, the archaeology, uh, well, all, all fields, all fields of human endeavor that are somewhat soft, including archaeology, uh, people have uh, very hardened ideas, especially if they've worked in the field for 50 years and printed three and published 300 papers, and then you come along with something entirely new, and this is new, and uh, they don't, generally don't like it. But they do publish it. <laughs> they do publish it, that's amazing. Well, yeah. Well, there are so many cases of people who have been ostracized. Oh, 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 science is politics. Science is politics. And, and everybody clings around the the uh, the money tree of funding, or at least in the United States, I'm sure elsewhere, where the federal government pours the money, that's where people, and that's where the referees are going to allow you to continue on. If you present an idea away from this this money tree, I mean, your chances, uh, your citation index is going to go down, your funding is going to go down, and whatever. So you have to work around that. You have to find ways to work around that. And since I'm uh, working in a national laboratory and high energy density plasma physics, thermonuclear physics, uh, well, I, 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 there are certain things that, that I can so certainly I'm encouraged to uh, publish on astrophysics, not on what I may actually work on, but on astrophysics, you know, which has the same energy density. So, yeah, yeah, yeah there, there's ways around. It's hard, but. Okay, gentlemen with the moustache. I worked as a radar fitter in the Air Force, and uh, I noticed there's this property that you have uh, current flows at 90 degrees to a voltage field within a wave in radar sets. Yeah. And when I first saw yeah, yeah. pinching the Z push, yeah. Uh, yeah. now is there a relationship between our man made plasma energy and the um, one? No, no the. Uh, uh, the Z pinch, uh, uh, high power microwaves also happens to be one of the fields that, that I have worked on. And, and, and so, yeah, so the, the first thing, you know, are these the, uh, uh, the, the various uh, electric field and magnetic field uh, patterns that you get in a TM01 waveguide or something like that? No, they're not. Uh, a, a, a Z pinch has got an anode and, and a cathode usually, and um, 
a capacitor bank that is driving it. In our case, uh, uh, we have about a three centimeter uh, long uh, target, which will be wires or gas or, or a foil. And then all of the current is dumped into that, and then the Z pinch then um, the material then vaporizes, uh, vapor melts, vaporizes, goes through various uh, phase uh, changes, and then it's fully stripped, fully ionized, so that you have a plasma, and then it pinches, and that's what we photograph. And we take uh, what's called uh, time frame photographs, so we can watch the evolution in time over a certain amount of time. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a set, nothing to do with microwaves, except uh, you cannot have an intense charged particle beams without producing microwaves. So, yeah, that's it. The, yes? uh, the African dances that were going on there with the, the big poles. Yeah. There's, there's no link with the asterisk poles and so on from the Jewish history. And the, they, they were worshipping the, the uh, planets and so on. Uh, they're, 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 they're called uh, either Siggy or Sigli um, headdresses. Uh, there's three very good ones uh, at the um, University of Pennsylvania right now that I'm waiting for uh, photographs. I, I saw them and, and uh, actually better than the ones that were in that picture. Um, now, you, you said something with regards to Jewish religion? Going back to the Hebrew time, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the fact that the. Uh, um, I forget. Okay, uh, typically you have a pattern of, of six or, or four. That is just preceding a kinkun or a kinkun, and then that's that's very that's very meaningful. It, it indicates a later point in time, to me. I don't know exactly what time, and 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 then you ask the mythologists. I mean, you really want to know. I I know the uh, relative time between the evolution of each of these instabilities. I know that from the laboratory and the and the plasma scales, as I said, 14 order of magnitude. So I get the relative time. I don't know the the exact time of the event. So the mythologists, and, and so, I, so I asked, okay, uh, Moses, take Moses. Okay, he talked to Pharaoh. Now that's a time point. Who is, who is Pharaoh? It, you know, no, nobody will tell me because nobody knows. The, you know, it's just Pharaoh. There's no name attached to it. So, so it's these sort of things that you look for in mythology. You, you, you look for hints of, of dates because because you want to know the date. Is, is it 4,000 years old? Uh, sometimes when I get out and, and I'm out in the field, and they could be 8,000 years old. And some are uh, as concentric with 56, might be chiseled with four centimeter uh, deep holes, and half of them are worn away in time. The other half were, shelled, were shielded, and they're still four centimeters deep. They might have been deeper. So were, are they 8,000 years old? I don't know. Um, and on that note concerning time, I'm afraid we must draw to a close. So could I call upon everyone here to thank Tony very warmly for this very interesting talk.